Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Herd Fit Podcast with Dr. Sam Ree and myself, Coach David Syverson. This podcast is aimed at helping anyone and everyone looking to enhance their healthy lifestyle through fitness, nutrition, and most importantly, mindset. All right, welcome back to the Hurry Fit Podcast. I am Coach David Syverson. I'm here with Dr. and Coach Sam Marie. And this is going to be episode two of the Hinshaw Reflection piece. That It's a two-part episode. Last week, if you missed part one, it's, it's last week. Just scroll back a little bit and it's right there. We're going to dive into the next few topics that I have based on the, the podcast and what I took from it and what I hope you guys took from it, what Sam took from it. And the next part is really going to be uh, about being strategic. And this is where you could start to separate sport and fitness a little bit. But again, I, I think you could always tie them two together a little bit. But this is where it separates a little bit more than usual. And he, he said this on the po- podcast. Are you strategic within your workouts or are you just kind of there for along the ride? Are you just there? Are you just along for the ride? Sorry. And that that stood out to me because I think a lot of people fall in that tier where they compete but they really just want to be seen or they're just there for the ride. And to, to competing to me is always you have a specific goal. It could be winning. It could be top 10. It could be top 10%. To me, that's when you're competing. Along for the ride is like on game day, you show up wanting to be there, wanting to compete. Competing to me is, hey, I train throughout the year so that I can try to hit this goal and at the end. The process. Really enjoy like I will do extra work or I'll put a lot of attention on my – squat form and my strength and my reps per minute in july august september and october so that in march i feel like i'm at my best shape and that that's where i feel like you're really in it to compete and really try to chase after a goal where it's oh uh the open starts in two weeks i'll maybe i'll start working on some muscle ups like that is you're along for the ride and that that's where uh, i think you can try to take your concentration on details to make you more strategic because at the end of the day, cross it workouts, right? When you're trying to achieve more work in a specific amount of time, it is almost always the smallest details that often get overlooked that are separating from you from where your goal is. The smallest details, the things you don't really think are a big deal, they, the sum of all of those are usually the margin between where you are and where you want to be. It doesn't need to be a life, like a huge life change. It doesn't need to be like you quit your job and start working out four times a day. It could be the smallest of details. And he gave the story about Becca Voigt, and he talked about this at the seminar as well. Becca Voigt, longtime games athlete. Part of the seminar, he talks about the, the, breath, the breathing cadence. He can tell by watching someone, or you can tell by listening to someone. It's hard to do in a gym because the music's on. If someone's about to redline or they're currently in redline stage, meaning they're not going to be able to go faster anymore. They're, they're either going to slow down or stop. And Becca Voigt told the story that she thought that was full of shit when Henshaw first said it. He's like, you can't tell by looking at someone or listening to someone like where they are mentally or physically in a workout. And then there was a games event on a run where she was next to someone. They were neck and neck and they were clearly racing each other. And she just, there was no music. They were outside. She heard the breathing. No, there's a cadence, like a, f- a quick four count where you can hear the inhale, exhale. The girl was doing a two count. So couldn't really, almost like hyperventilating, right? She could not breathe. And that Becca Voigt at that point knew, all right, cool. I can go into my next gear now because she's not going to be able to keep up. She did that. She won the race. And it was because of that, that she was able to take off with confidence and say, I, I got this. He he did make mention that this was for a advanced competitive athletes. Yeah. Yeah. You have to get to the point where you can be strategic just like Becca Voigt was or when he said he was coaching Kalipa and jamming him on the runs. Yeah. But he said also for all of us regular athletes, there is a whole lot we need to learn in addition to just getting to the strategic part. Or even prior to. Prior to in terms of he was teaching Kalipa foot strike. Mechanics. Mechanics. Yeah. Pacing. Here we go. Classic cross it model. Mechanics, number one. Consistency, right. number two. And then intensity, number three. And which is part of what the strategic yeah. planning is. Right. I When I listened to that, I felt like this would be perfect if you were going to Legends Comp or right. a high level athlete. Right. And you needed to see where you were. And you do this all the time. I know you do. Yeah. You look just Frazier looks at the same thing, yeah. like breathing and how yeah. everyone is. Yeah. And I've heard you talk about when you were at Legends Comp, looking at the people next to For you, sure. where their status yeah, was. You see like those big, but that they're about to slow down. Right. Yeah. This is, and it's so funny how it's it struck me listening to him talk about it and then listening to you in the past talk about how you look at other athletes. Mm-hmm. And I realized this is not just being 
a competitive asshole. It's about right. winning and looking at your competition right. and knowing where you can maximize your effectiveness. Right. And to me, I'm more on the other side. I'm not sitting there. In, I mean, I've done comps, but for me, I've never really strategically looked at yeah. athletes and, and worked that side of things. Right. But I could see if you were really chasing that. Yeah how important that would be for you. Yeah, and it's also, so you bring that up, it's also good for an athlete to know. We've done a podcast on this before. Are, are you more recreational or are you more on the competitive side? And this helps the coach coach you. Yes. And we've talked about this. We've talked about this off camera. Personally, like sometimes it's hard to know because it's not always like a, a black and white. We wish it was, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And it, it can be easier. It is. I'm telling you this right now. It is easier to coach, and it will, we will provide a better service for you individually if we know you want to get to that level someday. Or if you're like, dude, no interest. I want to be as fit as I can. I want to be a badass. I want to look great. That's what I want to do. We will coach you different, and I do that to this day. Like I can, I can know exactly. Like when I coach these long days, when like the big classes, I know which each person, for the most part what they want and how to coach them. And that takes a lot of time and experience, but it also takes a lot of conversation and honesty from the athlete that you need to be real about, hey, I really want this, or hey, I want this to be my year. Like, I'm, I'm really gonna go after this year, cool. I'm coaching you different for the next year. I This is also the difference between online events and yeah. in live programming. Yes. And this is why you shine at live programming because this is exactly the situation in which you need to be strategic. If I ever do another comp, I might, I don't know. Yep. This would be something I would really focus on because I feel like if in the events that I would be facing, if I had my basic mechanics down, yep. my movement quality down, then I would start thinking, how can I strategically podium? And this would be a very important factor in order for me to do that. That's a great point. So the, the next thing I want to touch on is coping with success and failure. And I think you asked a really good question on this. This is like one of your standout questions, in my opinion, was when you hear Vellner and Olsen talk, I mean, these guys are such good athletes. Like we can't even relate to how good they are. They're always at the top, right? But they haven't won the games. And there's always been someone else in front of them. And they always struggle to come up with a legit good answer that you really find yourself like nodding to. And he, to me, it's obvious, but when he, when Hinshaw responds the way he did, it just reaffirms something that I believe strongly in my head. And he talks about, he, he said, he goes, I don't care if they win or lose. And I think sometimes an athlete can take that the wrong way. If I went to an athlete and said that, that came to me with a, yeah, I want to win uh, CrossFit 908's goal, a comp is coming up. I want to win CrossFit 908. All right. Going to help you get there. It helps for me to know that because I know what it takes to win that kind of competition, what you have to be able to do, what you can't do, all this stuff, right? I don't really care that much if you win or lose. The only thing that you really care about is if they put all the work in. That That's really truly what matters. So as a coach, if their goal is to win something and you know what it takes to win, if they put all of that work in, it's irrelevant at that point whether they win or lose. Right. Correct. Because they put themselves into that position to win. Correct. But he said things can happen. There could be someone who's just flat out better than yeah. you. Yep. Uh, Literally had that written down in his quotes. Sometimes you just get beat. Right. And I mean, here's a question. What if I have two athletes at the same comp <laughs> and they both want to win? Because that's what he does. He coaches a lot of them. You should have followed up with that question. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. I wish I did because that that is a really unique thing. Like how? Like imagine Bill Belichick coached the Jets and the Pats. <laughs> Like what? That's really what this is. I mean, at this point, he's not taking as much of a global role in coaching yeah. as his, as he brought in as the hyper specialist for endurance programming right. for that particular athlete. I don't know. So he, you you notice he never talked about the most recent athletes he's coaching. Right. It's always these case studies from three years or four ago. years ago yeah. because or if not I, more. And he's also said he doesn't want to talk about performance of specific athletes. That's one thing he doesn't share. And I think I'd be interested in three or four years to see what he says about the athletes that he currently is helping, which yeah. he's not really talking so much about. Yeah. But I just like, from my perspective, as athlete and coach, there, there's a lot of failure that you deal with. And I don't think, it, it can't always be viewed as, oh, like I failed my heavy snatches today. I failed my muscle ups. And I get that a lot. You know, a muscle up day. We have a muscle up day coming up next Tuesday. And that workout does not look that bad on paper. I just posted it and it's going to be very hard and people are going to be failing muscle ups and they're going to get, they're going to get frustrated. They're going to feel like they're failing. Right. And 
I think one thing the athlete needs to really step away from is that immediate emotion of, I did well, I did. Sam today was telling me that he did, was not able to string his muscle-ups together, right? But what was the first thing you said after? He goes, like, I just, I haven't done them. So are you really allowed to be upset if that's the case? I've said that same thing with my pistols, right? There's only so much I can do until my knees hurt too much where I just can't work out. But I know that I've done everything in the past year. So if they come up in two weeks, and trust me, I'm nervous about it. If they, if they come up in a huge way in the qualifiers, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do as hard as I can. But I'm not going to be, I'm not going to allow myself to walk out of there being upset because I know I did everything I could in the past year. There's always two sides to this, which I always wrestle with. And I, I haven't gotten, I've gotten more depth on both sides, but I don't think I've gotten resolution in terms of how to reconcile this conflict between, listen, if you're not winning, you're losing. (laughs) But then on the other hand, if you did your best and you tried your hardest and you didn't win, that's okay. Yeah. So which one is it? Because mm-hmm. we're talking about both sides of the coin. Yep. And I honestly, for myself, can only say sometimes I have to take that mindset. If I'm not winning, right. I'm lo- I've yeah. lost. Yeah, right. And take that Michael Jordan, take no prisoners attitude. Yeah. Yep. But in some cases, I'm also going to have to go with the, if I really tried my hardest, yep. I can take that as... I don't want to say a psychologic win or a mm-hmm. you know but, moral, but moral victory moral victory but I can live with myself and not say yeah. I lost. Right. I'm sure people have to figure out their own way of dealing with that yep. because I don't necessarily know whether there's a good issue or not. Mm-hmm. I would love to talk to a Noah Olson or a Pat Vellner and yeah. say what does it feel like never to win the CrossFit yeah. games yeah. even though you got this close? Yeah. And honestly if I don't know because yeah. I, I'm, I've never been that good of an athlete to be even in that position. And if I asked them that, they'd probably be like, F you, buddy. Yeah. You don't even know what it's like to be second. What was your 22.1 right. score? And so it would be very presumptuous of me to even yeah. ask. Yeah, it has, it has to be taken in the right context. It has to be delivered in the right context too. Right. You know, if you were to actually ask them that question. But if on the other hand, they, they are winners and they want to win so yeah. badly yeah. that I can only see that as being a frustration on one level. Yep. To, and there are athletes in every sport who hasn't won a championship. Absolutely. What does that mean to them? I yeah. don't know. No, it's it's definitely something worth looking into. I just love asking Chris Henshaw this question and seeing what his answers are. And, yeah. and he, like you said, he does both. He has he tells us about Matt Frazier. Yeah. He also tells us about Kara Saunders yep. not winning. And and right. yet he takes Julie Fache, yeah. Right. Julie Fache, And and he says it's okay either way. Mm-hmm. So even Chris Henshaw is someone who looks at it from both sides. I think really what it goes down to is you have to, I think it's important for competitors to not define themselves by winning and losing. And that's tough because you could bring up Michael Jordan, right? But you could also bring up Dan Marino, right? Like these are, these are people that are the elite of the elite and they're not getting to that act, but you can't, not everyone can win. And and that's, that's the case. Like we have, I'm pursuing something. Not everyone can make the top 30 to make the semifinals. It doesn't mean anyone, I don't really define myself as an athlete of, success and because there's things I know that other people don't about what goes into it, what I did do, what I didn't do, because you're not doing everything perfect for absolutely. There's no question about that. And Noah Olson and Patrick Vellner might have the same answer. Like, yeah, I did everything I could, but did you really? Did you really on every moment, like every waking minute of every day, really do what you had to do? Or be smart about it and figure out I have to do something different. Yes. Yeah. Like, yep. Because again, that when he brings up these guys that are in hamster wheels, like every year, then they're just in the same spot. They never get better, but they never get worse. What are you actually changing? Right. And I think Noah Olson did, if I remember correctly, he did say he's not a big guy. I mean, he looks yoked, but he's small. He he, we, he actually said he's going to start losing weight, cut weight. He said he did. Yeah, I think so. So I, I think maybe that's his out of the box thought this time. But I, I think it's important for people not to put their self worth into it. I, I really do. I think that the self-worth should be put into like, did I really put forth what I, the effort that I wanted to, right? And, and I think that if you, and only you really know the answer, like, I don't really care what you put on social media or tell your friends or even your family. Did I really put the effort that I wanted to in? And uh, I think that's really where that answer is is solved as much as it possibly can be. Because I don't think there's ever going to be a black and white answer on it. It's whatever you wanted to put into it to pursue the goal, did you actually follow through? It depends on the individual. I know some people who only define themselves through winning. Yeah. And if they haven't won, it's 
it's as if nothing has happened. Right. It's worse than anything. Yeah. And well, hopefully that person can down the road reflect on all the positive that came out. It's of it. a brittle. It, there, it, that's a really brittle lifestyle. Yeah, it is to define yourself only through the act of winning. Yep. And Especially on a physical. Correct. Physical but, but we see that in CrossFit too. The people who have to be at the top of the leaderboard or beat someone else every day, yeah. that's how they define whether yeah, or not they, they had a good They can't slow it down. Right. They yeah. can't, like, did they have a good workout? Well, did I beat Dave? Yeah. Okay, I guess I did have a no. good workout. <laughs> <laughs> but no, he, here's, here's a good example. And we do have to tailor to this as CrossFit coaches, even at a local box, is on Wednesday's workout, we did that re active recovery workout. Right. And people did like it for the most part. I got some good feedback on it. Those that have bad feedback didn't give it to me. So, <laughs> but. The, the, we what did we do that day? We didn't record the results. Why? No. Why? I thought it was just an experiment because you wanted to see what it. This was a new style of programming. Yeah. So that was part of it, but it was also I wanted everyone to chase after the correct movements and stimulus of the workout, and I felt that if we were recording times up there, right? We told you guys to do a thirty second recovery row, right? I bet some people, if there were times on the board to chase, and they started to see that, oh man, like I might be within ten seconds of Owen. I'm going to make this row 20 seconds. No one's going to know. Or oh, they'll go ultra slow. I've like, seen this all the time. People but do that, that all the time on the rest, on right. the workouts with rest. They yeah. short the rest. Oh, yeah. And it's a mistake. There's no question. Well, they're cheating mistake. themselves. Yes, yes. For a better score. Yep. So let's we can make a little bit of a, a left-hand turn here. And we'll talk about something that's probably not as much about mindset. It's actually, it, it could be. I mean, everything can be timed back to the mindset. But it's about pacing, right? Where... The, the thing I started off th this part was athlete, and this is, comes from him, the athletes think they are working hard based on the result alone. Example we just talked about. The only thing that signifies my hard work is that what's my time? What's my score? What's my performance? And it really needs to, the, when it comes down to pacing, right? I, we did a workout where I was really trying to teach about pace last week too. And Elena asked me, she goes, why why pace? <laughs> <laughs> That's so Elaine. I know it is, and and I I actually we we talked about it a little bit, and I will say this, and I'm trying to get better at this. I promise, I understand it better than I can talk about it, and I'm trying to get. I'm actually starting to write thoughts down, and I started to write a post that I was going to put in Beast of Bison, and I was rushing through it, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to save this. So I just saved it on my computer, so that when I have a little bit more time to really put good thoughts into it. Because I do, I want to get better at explaining this, where things, if you really do want to get better at pacing, like you really do need to break everything down. We, we talked about this where Hinshaw like was surprised we brought this up. Mixed modal, like it's it's a little bit easier to pace running, biking, mach like machines, right? Like splits, like really even splits. It's harder to pace mixed modal work, whether it's like lifting and gymnastics and heavy stuff, right? Um like right now I'm working with Liz on some like reps per minute stuff. And I, I, I feel like sometimes I'm giving too much information. She's like, all right, so I need to average 18 reps per minute. I'm like, well, yeah, but not on muscle ups. Because muscle ups is two movements and it's a really high level movement. So that really has to be about 10 reps per minute. And I was like, but once the weight goes above 65%, it's got to be like 0.5 reps per minute. But like it's, it can get really overwhelming at, at a certain point. But that is what it takes. Like you, when you were really, really trying to pace things, it's easy to pace a mile. If you have an eight minute mile, it's two minutes per lap, right? But what, that that's an that's easy math to do. But what if we started talking about, like, you know, how many meters you'd be running per step? That's really what you're looking at in a workout with burpees and kettlebell swings and wall balls. Is so he started talking about Laura Horvath's pace mm -hmm. in twenty two point two. She goes, yeah, her, her slowest burpee was three point eight seconds. Her fastest was one point four. Who knows that? Who, who thinks like that? Chris Henshaw does. Exactly. And he's the best endurance mind in the coach. And he said that the contrast of that, that they call it rate of fatigue. And I have this whole thing on my computer that he sent to us through the seminar about that, that it's called rate of fatigue slash rate of slowing. How much did your rate slow? So her fastest was 1.4. Her slowest was over three. So you're looking at over a hundred percent increase in how long the rep took. She goes, that's terrible. You should never have that. And it, it's all about pacing to me is all about working with, especially in like day-to-day -day workouts, it's all about widening your base. So if you have a wider base to stand on, all right, you're going to be more secure as you try to elevate your performance in a workout. What are your initial thoughts on pacing? This is something that you need, an athlete alone cannot figure this out. I think the genius that Chris Henshaw presents is the formulas and the spreadsheets that he has, right. because that is literally pacing personified. Right. 
So if you want to get from this, where you are now to this performance level, yeah. you have to follow a progression. Right. And that progression is, is a pacing progression. So you have to finish this amount of time. Like, and he talked about it. If you run this far, what is your 200 meter? What's your 400 meter? What's your 800? 800. Yeah. And, and so if you look at, he, we peeked at the spreadsheets. He actually allowed us to yeah, see a little which bit, which was crazy, which was insane. That progression is very specific and it's based on his knowledge and you're able to plug in where you are. And I think it was a running scheme, but mm. it, it, you could, and you could probably adapt similar strategies for other things, but then your pacing has to change and improve over time to where you want to go. Right. And that's not something that as an athlete, even you working with Liz, that's mm -hmm. freaking complicated. Right. So complicated. And as a coach, that's what this aerobic capacity course is probably helping people do mm -hmm. is figure out that, or you can also just sign up for aerobic capacity and for certain movements, Absolutely. like, like yeah. running and so forth. Yeah. They put out free content all the time. Yeah. If, if you're not following aerobic capacity on Instagram, you're doing it wrong. It's free content and it's it's quality. And the other thing is if I think when you do sign up for it, he does personalize it for you yeah. because that's what those formulas are. So you do an assessment, you do whatever it is that you want to do, that you're doing, and then they program a, a whole series of workouts so you get to where you want to, be, to go. Right. And that's what this pacing progression is. It's That's literally what improvement in athleticism is, is improving your pacing. Yep. And that, another thing that he stood out to me, and sometimes I'm like, man, Henshaw loves CrossFit. And I'm like, sometimes like he hates CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, the, the concept of, and Elena, this is for you, all right, but also most CrossFitters, the concept of going slower so you can be faster is so hard for CrossFitters to understand. And he goes, this is how I took a minute off of Rich Froning's mile time, a minute off of Noah Olson's mile time. And by the way, guys, their mile times are already sub six. Or so, like right over six, like elite mile times. Took a minute off of it, almost a twenty percent improvement, right? Kara Saunders, Kara Saunders, yeah, guys and girls. And he goes, I did it by making them run slower two days a week. No, there was no like go run harder, get that mile done. And he talked about the aerobic capacity course about there's a multiple things that you train, and it's the different speeds. But he will also teach you, like, all right, I want you to run the mile at this pace. Eventually, you're going to start – you have to get good at running 100 meters at that pace and then walk, right? And then 200 meters at that pace. And then there's longer distances at slower rates. And he goes, all these elite athletes that he works with – and again, I know not everyone needs to strive for that, but it does help to know the details of these guys and help improve their performance if that's what you're going for. They have 13 different speeds that they run at. Yes, he said that. 13. 13. And that's, again, these guys are full-time athletes. That they, that's, that's what they get paid to do. But when I program, I give three. I'm like slow, medium, fast. And when I think about it, and I'm sure a lot of people are like, I got one speed. Yeah. <laughs> I hear that one a lot. <laughs> and he goes, and he goes, CrossFit in a lot of ways is like endurance. And I think that's why there's like a marriage here between Hinshaw and CrossFit. It's very similar to the endurance world in terms of performance and how to enhance it. And he goes, there is not a single endurance athlete in the world that trains like crossfitters right like we label high intensity as go hard for 20 rest for 10 and he goes it's amazing how many crossfitters think they're high intensity and they spend over half of their workout with their hands on their knees half of our workouts are mostly rest actually. yeah and he goes so he goes well, how is that considered high intensity what do you classify as high, high intensity and it has to go far beyond your heart rate and this is where a concept that we're trying to get into the gym is that you jack the heart rate up, not through your lactate threshold, all right? But you jack it up, but then you don't come crashing back down via doing nothing. You keep it, you let it come down a little bit, but you try to stay, your, your, minimum, your floor is higher. You're not crashing, going up, crashing, going up. You're going up, not as high, all right? AKA pacing, slow down at the beginning of the workout. Try to maintain a nice steady pace and finish strong. And it, it really, it goes so deep and we could, we could just talk it for an hour about this, I bet. And then how we can relate it to certain workouts, single movement workouts, uh, chippers for time workouts, AMRAPs, length of time, all that. But the pacing, anything over three minutes, according to him, all right, is you have to pace it. So if you don't have a pacing plan for a workout that's over three minutes, you are not going to get your best time. And I, I think that's something we should all adopt on a day-to-day -day basis. So the data, okay, he's got a lot of data. What do you do with all this data? So this is where I think Hinshaw is going to have a, a leg up on a lot of people that are trying to emulate him, all right? 
is he runs these programs and you can go on open capacity. You can sign up, you can sign. I think he has that relationship with mayhem where you might have to buy like one of their online memberships to really get like full exposure to some of this stuff. But he gets so much information and he said it, he goes, I take this information that I get from this assault bike program, or sorry, the rogue echo bike progression, one minute, five minute, 10 minute tests. And he goes, I get to use thousands of numbers. I put them into my spreadsheet. It comes up with these custom paces that you need to follow. That's what he's doing with data. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Because he is a, a numbers nerdy kind of guy. The guy is a gene. Like he is so enthusiastic about the numbers and the spreadsheets. And the fact is, is that success is built on data. Right. We know that. Yeah. You look at the world now and it's, it's all data driven. The fact that he has told us he has thousands and thousands of athletes doing his programming and he's able to see what their results are custom the formulas and the algorithms that he has in terms of progressions in terms of building aerobic capacity that's what i asked about is why is he not scaling this up into some ginormous enterprise and i think honestly and we talked about this is that it because that's not the way he's built he's not built like a jeff bezos where he wants to take over the world in terms of programming and athletics and crossfit and he's repeated this multiple times the matt chan story about wanting to share this information mm -hmm. with everybody. Yeah. The only thing he doesn't want to do is he doesn't want to get ripped off. And I feel like early on he was people were stealing his workouts, yep. a la Froning Fraser. Yeah. <laughs> and at, <laughs> but if he could legitimately share it to the world and not feel ripped off, he would he would totally do that. Yeah. That's what he cares about. And he does. He 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 said on the podcast he's excited as he's ever been to share what he knows and all the information he's getting. Because I think now that he has that relationship with Mayhem, he's getting a lot of information. And information to him is just people working out. I really hope that he also publishes it in some way, shape, or form. And I yeah. hope that CrossFit pushes him to do so. So as of recent, that uh, aerobic capacity is now an official CrossFit course again. Exactly. It was and then it wasn't and that it is again. It now is an official CrossFit course. And he talked about talking to Glassman and Glassman was always so kind to him and, and yeah. so interested in what he yeah. had. And as a physician, we're biased towards looking at research papers, mm -hmm. research projects, making it statistically sound. Yep. And if there was someone that was willing to work with him and do that, I mean, I don't think he really has that interest of doing that. He's proved, proved it to himself. And I think he doesn't necessarily feel like he has to make it scientifically rigorous and run these sort of super big trials. Yeah. But if he did, I think they would change exercise physiology. Yeah. I think the things that we intuitively are looking at and and understanding, hey, why aren't we taking advantage of the downside of the yeah, curve? Yeah, the bell curve. Yeah. yeah. All of these things that seem to make sense, he could make it more scientific if he wanted to. I'm not sure if he does or if he doesn't want On to. On the educational side, he is, he did say this in the podcast, so it's not like we're not sharing anything we shouldn't be, but he he wants to create the aerobic capacity at level two. So right now he's coaching the level one and now he's grooming people to coach the level one for him and he's going to come up with a level two course. And that's a step in that direction, I believe. And he did say off camera after, he goes, I do think you're going to see a major shift in, I don't know if it was fitness programming or CrossFit programming in terms of it would be more... He didn't say this. I'm speculating that it would be closer to what his aerobic capacity workouts are. He says something it, similar to what we did Wednesday with not every time, but workouts like we were still doing, we're doing interval work this week on Wednesday, two minutes on, two minutes off, right? That's still going to be out there. And that's mm -hmm. still part of the conditioning, but more workouts that have like intentional rest tasks to take on. Yes. I think the first step CrossFit did take was programming rest in the open, in the open. Yes. Now the next step is interval task yeah in yeah interval task and then also just filtering that down to crossfit.com programming there have been some workouts lately i don't know if this is a hinshaw influence but they where they do send out a workout with, with some like slower pace running at the end of a round or something like that that could be hinshaw influenced or that could just be general there's just more people than him that that program stuff like that he says crossfit is very traditional yeah it, it is slow to change I will say CrossFit.com programming, I still see a ton of back squat, one, 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 <laughs> yeah. record your heaviest weight. And yeah. you're like, okay, yeah. great. Right. Yeah. I know. That's 
that's always those are always tough. I mean, they're important. Strength's important, but there probably are better ways to test it. And I, I do wish we were able to talk to him more. I mean, there's so many things I wanted to talk to him about. I do wish we could get a little bit more reflection from him on, even though he's not a strength coach, I'm sure he has some valid opinions on how to enhance strength in relation to CrossFit. Yeah. So I have two left here, and then we could probably tie them together because number one is what the, the reflections he had on coaching men versus women and how he preferred coaching women over men and also the willingness to, to listen. And I think the two really did tie together. I got the vibe when I re-listened to it for like the, the third or fourth time that willingness to listen. And then we talked about men versus women after that. They were, he was basically just repeating himself in that it got, I think that the fact that we were talking about listening and the willingness to do that got him almost got the engine going on the men versus women. Like that meant women are much better to coach than men. Yeah. And I don't think he meant it in anything other than women are better athletes because they are more coachable right. in general. And I think this stems from his direct experience of trying to train CrossFit Games athletes. The reason why he rhapsodizes over Kalipa is because he was one of the rare super coachable guys. Right. The reason why he talks about Frazier and Froning is because they are winners yeah. and they've adapted his training to, to win. But you don't hear so many of the other male athletes that he's trained mm -hmm. in terms of examples of coachability. And it, he's not the kind of guy that would throw someone under the bus. No. And you could probably just speculate on all the ones he's tried to, but- because He did say this. He goes, men, so initially men will respond saying, I already knew that. I already knew that. I already knew that. And he goes, and then they come back to me. They tend to calm it down when they don't have the solutions to their problems anymore, where they think they can figure it all out, which is very guyish, right? And that, when he said that, I'm on the same page as you. There had there has to have been some specific guys that were like that. It always reminds me of that story where the coach is telling a guy's basketball team, "Hey, listen, you guys aren't communicating. Make sure you guys do a better job." And then the guys in the team are like, "Yeah, all you guys, you guys aren't communicating. Do yeah. better." <laughs> and then you tell the girls' basketball team, and they're like, "Oh man, I'm not communicating very well. I I, I need to do better." <laughs> like guys never look at themselves. And th this is, these are such broad stereotypes. Yeah, no, it is. And it's not like I'm gender bashing in a certain way, but yeah. I, but, but if we're going to gender bash, we're going to gender bash guys just so we don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would say from my own experience, um, looking at uh, my son's teams yep. and my daughter's teams. Good, good, uh, that, good idea to bring that up. That, the, that stereotype tends to, to hold true, yep. especially about coachability. I it's cannot, funny. My, uh, I would say one of my personality weaknesses are like my brothers. We're all stubborn and we grew up with all boys. <laughs> I'm telling you, it probably has part of to do with oh it. Oh my God. I tried you know? coaching my, my son's soccer team and yeah. trying to tell those guys what to do, especially at a younger age is, is impossible, <laughs> impossible. And the, and the girls soccer teams, they would listen to the coach. You'd ask them to do something, yeah. show your shin guards, do this. Yeah. The kids. The guys. I'll tell you what, I mean, I'll take my experience as a CrossFit coach. It's been a long time now, so there's some credibility there that the women always have. I've, I don't know if it's I've connected with them better or they're just easier to coach because I have noticed that I coach more women in a, like when it comes to like extra work, right? If we want to bring up next level or just either past stuff, women, I, I've done more work with women than men. And I, that, I don't even know why that is. It might just be that there is less ego. Like a lot of guys could probably think that they can figure it out on there, their own. They're just going to show it up. You're a thousand percent right because that Where the girls are, they're not, will, they're not afraid to say, yo, I need some help. Absolutely. The, the, I could apply myself and Susan as an example. Yeah. Susan is probably one of the people who has done next level with religious. Yes. Yeah. And I have dipped into it and, and then not, but it's because I'm like, well, yeah, I, I need to figure some of this stuff out on my own. Right. Not like ego wise, yeah, but more that's just the way you're wired. Me, I need to try to figure some of this yeah. stuff out. Right. Susan I, is not afraid to say, "Just tell me what to give do. me some help." Yeah, and I can do better with it. Right. And if you look at all the the athletes that made quarterfinals, nine women mm -hmm. made it, four dudes made it. <laughs> Why do you think that is? I think it's because the women are more coachable. Ooh, that's a bold statement. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's going to get the stink eye from every dude to come in the gym from now on. No, but it's there's no doubt. And this is the thing that we've talked about this before. Like before the Henshaw interview, we've talked about stuff like this. And for him to say it too, 
I, I, I do think some guys out there, if you're listening to this and you're, whether you're in a rut or you do want to get better and you're trying to figure things, some things out, I think you got to put the guard down and I'm meeting with two guys next week, three guys next week, actually. And one after the qualifiers. That, that, so I'm not saying all guys do this, right? I actually give credit to the guys that have said, like, hey, I'm, like, at this roadblock right now. I need some help. And, but for every one of those, it's usually three or four girls. I don't think you have to hang up your manhood in order to be coachable, yeah. which some people do think. Yep. Look at Froning. Look at Frazier. These guys yeah. listened and followed what a coach said. Right. And I don't think that anyone would call them any less dude-like than anyone else. And I could I would speculate on the athletes that actually have more an ego that might not have podiumed or or gotten consistently. <laughs> Who's your guess? N- no clue. I'm not going to say out loud. I don't oh, know. Okay. I, oh, yeah. Do you do you want to say? No, I mean I, I I do I do wonder. I know it's like, I don't know if I want to say it either. Not that they're ever going to hear it, but it's more. I, I if I was an elite athlete, which I'm not. I'm not a games athlete. Right. Never been close. I I would be all over Hinshaw. I would be on his front door and begging him to work with me. But if you were that talented and you've gotten so far on your own. Well, that's the thing. A lot of these guys are here for the ride, right? They care about how many Instagram followers they have. They care, they care about how many likes they get on a picture in a bathing suit more than their performance. And I, I think that's a huge thing that it's almost like you don't want to go into Instagram to me is like social media in general. It's all like fantasy world to me. Like none of it, most of it's not real mm. when, when you're really surfing through stuff, right? It's just mm. like highlights only, right? Mm. And th- it seems like there's so much attention put on it for some people that they forget that that's not what's that is not what got them to where they are in terms of being a games athlete. Like it was a grind for a lot of years, and I almost feel like if you lose track of that, you will you'll never get better. And part of me is, is I would I don't understand why any athlete at a high level would not go to him. I really I just don't get it because it's a proven system that works. I think people I think most of them have. And I think he's rejected a whole bunch of them. Yeah. That's what like, I think. I, I, you think about some of the athletes that are always the strongest, but they never do well on the engine, right? Danny Spiegel. All right. She's always one of the strongest athletes. And but she, you know, okay. But how, we've how heard she, enough anecdotal stories about her in general yeah, from others to right. know that. There's a lot of ego there. There's just, yes. A lot going on. Well, there. yeah. The I fact mean, that even, she gets yeah. docked for cheating, ma- like major cheating every, every event. Yeah. Like, come on. No, I still remember the day watching her Wadapalooza workout where she was deadlifting and yelling at her judge for getting no rep, where she was clearly doing not even three quarters of her rep. Was it even close? And then you watch some of her open videos and her quarterfinal videos, and she's a part of that whole YouTube sensation where they're docking her reps and stuff like that. Like, she can't even do a, a bar-facing burpee correctly, right? Like, where your, your feet and hands have to be on each side of the line. If you can't do that, it's what we tell our athletes all the time. If you can't do that, Stop. Go back to the beginnings. And you wonder, is that like how many people around her are telling her this? I bet none. Right. Because you're afraid to. You're afraid to. But if she I would tell you, why is she always, always, always near the bottom on the endurance events? And if it's, hey, Dave, I gave my best effort. That's it. Good for you. Awesome. But if I was someone like that and I'm not. Right. I'm not strong enough to, to say yeah, I win the strength events, but I don't do the endurance events. Right. I'd be knocking on his door begging. I really would. A lot of this is psychology. I think I see guys who are relatively high performers, but maybe they have some issues about certain parts of their performance. Maybe they got injured. We recently had a pretty high performing athlete who took a really long time off and came back. And I believe that a lot of that was ego, yeah. was was insecurity mm-hmm. what and and i i grapple and deal with that too mm-hmm. and i feel like when we as people can come t- to terms with our self-image our self in terms of self-esteem about being secure in ourselves it's it helps us reach out and get coached and right. help right. better but dude that encompasses your entire life. Right, right. And there are so many factors that are involved with that. Yeah. So as a coach in CrossFit to expect to figure out how to make someone more coachable or work with them on that, it, yeah. I, I don't think that that's always going to be the case. Right. I, I think it's, it's, t- it's tough to even speculate on right now because we just, at the end of the day, we don't have all the information. That's the that's the other to, part to of To have it. the real credible opinion about it. Yeah. But again, if you're going to ask us like where... Where does an athlete on the highest level come up short? If it's always the same thing, then you have to ask yourself what Hinshaw asked in the podcast. Are you doing everything to attack that weakness? I ask myself, why is it that I am avoiding something or don't want to do something? Why do I feel negatively about something in my workouts or what am I doing? And is it is it stemming from 
something within myself, right. an insecurity, an unwillingness to show that I am not good at something. If that's the case, then I need to look at it myself and address it because I'm not a grown guy. I should be able to right. figure those things out. Right. And I think all of us should, if we want to be better as athletes and everything else, What what is it? pulling in a, a negative emotional response. Why is it that I don't want to do this? Right. Why is it that I like doing this? Right. And if it's because of some insecurity about what that is, then maybe I should flip it and say, hey, Dave, I'm, I'm really, this. I don't like this and I don't enjoy it or I feel really bad about this. Let me work on this to make this better for right. myself. Yeah, so like you tie that back to this topic of like willingness to listen. I, I think the first part someone needs to do, ask yourself if you're willing to listen, how often do you seek people to listen to? I think that's a huge thing. And not it can't be your friends. Honestly, it shouldn't be your friends. And if you have a coach that's a friend, tough thing. Hopefully you're, you're able to separate the two. That's the one thing I've been working on a lot the past two years. I don't know if it's made some of my friends less friends with me, but I take my job so seriously as a CrossFit coach that if that means I take a bite out of the friendship a little bit, that I, I'm fine with that. And it's because I know it's because I care about the person, what they need, big picture, and what they want, big picture, right? And hopefully the two sides, so like if Hinshaw is coaching you or Sam's coaching you or I'm coaching you, when the coaching is occurring, when the conversation about coaching is going on, you're not friends in that moment because that's when you can really listen to them from that perspective and have it impact who you are, what you're doing, what you're trying to accomplish. If you're unable to separate friend and coach, I don't think that person should coach you or you shouldn't be friends, one of the two. I think uh, I've gotten to the point where I can separate the two yeah. 100%. Yeah. I mean, not 100%, but in, in most instances. Right. I've heard you yell at me in workouts and I'm like, God, stop yelling. But <laughs> stop I know yelling. why you're like in my head, I'm thinking that, but now I'm like, okay, this is the reason why. And I need to focus on yeah. this. Same with the other day, Mike uh, Delator, I was uh, doing those overhead squats mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it was at the end and I was getting tired and he goes 60, 40 on the heels. And I'm like, I know I am trying to yeah. keep on my heels, <laughs> but thank you, Mike. But you know what? It did actually help, and I did sit a yeah, little bit more back on my heels. And you're not going home being pissed off about no, it. No, and I yeah. talked to Mike, and I said, listen, I appreciate it. Yeah. At the very second when you said it, did yeah. I appreciate it? No, yeah. but, right. I, but it helped me. Yep. And at the end of the day, whatever emotion I'm feeling within anything, it's okay because after it, I love Mike. Like, yeah. That was awesome. And you know you why, for helping. And you know what he's doing. I, a, a thousand percent. And at the end of the day, that's really the only thing that matters. And he's, and he's there trying to help you out. And that's what athletes need to to know is is that whatever you're feeling about anything, if we're on your ass, it's, yeah. it's not because we hate you or we think you stink. It's, right. It's, it's emotional intelligence. That's really what it comes down to. You need to be able to be intelligent while being emotional. Yeah. And if you can't, like if you take things personal, so true. Then that's something you need to work on because then that then there is no coaching, and and, and that's where I, I think that and we're both athletes and coaches, so we can both we um can both work on that as coaches and athletes. But I really I want every athlete to know that that there's emotional intelligence that it comes into play when you're being coached, and that's why women are better than men. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You know, so that, that kind of wraps up my thoughts. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add in on, on the podcast with Hinshaw. No, he's just a really smart guy. Yeah. He loves numbers. And it's so funny because the podcast was all done. We, he didn't have to talk to us anymore. And he said, come on over here. And he, he, he pulled his laptop and he opened it up and he showed us these the, uh, his uh, formulas and his algorithms and his spreadsheet. It was overwhelming and to I, even look at. Right. And, and he didn't have to do these. He things. was so excited. He's about just too. excited about he, it. He literally said, "What's his, what's the girl's name? Heidi. Heidi. He, I almost said Haley. I'm like, that's not right." And he said, uh, "He goes, nothing turns me on like a spreadsheet other than Heidi." <laughs> <laughs> he does. He truly is in the most complimentary fashion ever a, a nerd when it comes to this stuff. And it's when I say that, I mean he can look at his spreadsheet with all these times and numbers and rate of fatigue and his coding. Whenever someone talks about coding, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming for me. He gets so excited about it. And like that that kind of passion is like, I think that's a big part of why he does well as a coach. Well, because think about this. He was an incredibly successful salesman prior to getting involved with CrossFit, into aerobic capacity, CrossFit games, athletes, whatever. Incredibly successful. He noted it. At the uh, at the seminar, he's like, I made a lot of money as a salesman, and he he was very vocal about that. How common is it for someone like that 
to come into a CrossFit space, which is really more about like raw fitness, try hard, high intensity. And he flipped this program up upside down. But the funny thing is, is for someone who is so numbers oriented, he has an incredible amount of, as you said, emotional intelligence, empathy, the human side of things to work with people and work with them as coaches. The fact that he uses his own personal experiences, for example, being scared about starting CrossFit. When he talks about these athletes, he, I know he repeats himself in a lot of podcasts, Yeah, but this is his reasoning. His reasoning is it's like business school. In business school, they have case studies of different companies, McDonald's, Xerox, and, and you're supposed to learn from these case studies. He puts these athletes up as case studies for people to understand this is why you build confidence in an athlete. Right. This is why coachability is important. Yeah. This is why pacing is important. This is why strategic planning in a workout or, or in an event or in a competition is important. Yeah. And he holds them up so that people can use them as case studies and they are relatable because they're very famous people in the right. CrossFit space. Yeah. I don't think, I think if all you did was send him coachable athlete after coachable athlete, and he just programmed numbers for them and, and got them to get to where they wanted to go, he'd be in nirvana. Yeah, but he right. realizes that dealing with human psychology and, and people and- Well, and, he, I mean, that story he told about his, his dad being a litigator. He loved that story. And you know what? That's the I first feel, time he's ever shared that story. I feel story. honored that he sh shared that story oh, with us. He brought that up the next day when we were talking. He, he's, that was a, that's a very like personal thing that he shared. And that was a very psychological story. So the story was- It tied it perfectly. Yeah, you want, you want to say that? Yeah, story? I mean, I don't want to get it wrong, but basically the, the gist of the story was that his father was a big-time litigator, one of the best, I think, voted the best by Harvard, and medical malpractice litigator. And defense. Defense lawyer. And he basically, in front of a jury, was talking to an economist- and he was circling like the, these questions, like left and right, that basically made the economist look like a fool. Right. So the economist was talking about how much money this person would be losing from whatever what this loss, right? Yeah, whatever injury was sustained. And and the uh, Henshaw's father was basically asking questions in a very strategic manner that the whole room knew this guy was full of it. That's right. But he never called him out. And That's Henshaw said like asked him after, dad, why would you not call them out? You you had them. And he goes, you never want to take the decision-making ability, the power of the decision-maker out of their own hands. Right. He said, don't you think the jury knows that? Yeah. And so by not calling him out and letting the jury listen to it and come to their own conclusions yep. and not telling the jury, this guy is, doesn't know what he's talking about. Yep. The jury, he said, already knew yep. the guy didn't know what he was talking about, which is why and then he tied that back into Yasuo's 800 right. and, and Kalipa's workout where he said, I didn't have to tell Kalipa anything. Yeah. I so, showed it to him. And we're going to tie this to something that we're, we're going on this weekend right now. I don't, I hate to keep bringing this up, but we have these, the court, master's quarterfinals in two weeks, putting through the mass, most of them through a, a simulation weekend right now. And the simulation weekend is basically five workouts that will replicate what we're going to be doing in two weeks. And you have to do them Two on Friday, two on Saturday, one on so five workouts in three days, basically. And we, we don't—they're hard. The workouts are really hard. The Bison Wad. If we're listening, we're listening to this a couple of weeks after. It's the uh, it was the workout with the fifty lunges, twenty-one handstand push-ups, forty lunges, deficit handstand push-ups, right? Ending with the tr strict handstand push-ups. That's that weekend. They, these athletes are doing four other really hard workouts within forty-eight hours of that window, and. It's not just because we love to work out, right? And we love CrossFit. Uh, that's not really the reason behind it, is we want to show these athletes what you are actually capable of in a, a very short amount of time, very high skill, very high weight workouts, and how do you respond day to day? How do you respond doing a workout an hour after a previous workout? How do you respond to eating and sleeping a certain way? And Sam, you're 54? Yeah, uh, 52. Oh, you're 52, that's right. He just PR'd his deadlift this morning. And how many 52-year-olds know that? I don't want to keep always bring up age, but how many 52-year-olds that have been doing CrossFit with a high training age, been doing it for a long time, seven, eight years now, PR their deadlift after a workout that had hang snatches at 135 and muscle-ups. This is what it's almost like, and trust me, I'm not on the intellect level of Hinshaw. That's not, like, that's not, I was not thinking Sam's going to PR his deadlift today, but you do want to show these athletes what you're actually capable of, and you don't want to just tell them they're great. 
right? I did. I told them they're great after they qualified. I said, hey, good job, guys, right? But when you show them what they can do, like we're watching Kathleen, Elena, Reina, and Kelly do that, the run, rope climb, front squat workout. And we we're Sam and I were reflecting on it after. We're like, holy cow, like these guys are monsters and like, they might not even know it. They're also hard on themselves. And I hope that some of this programming and coaching and prep for a weekend like that, it shows them like, yo, you're a baller and you have the power to make these decisions here uh, that to really go after and perform well at a perform at a high level. Well, that's, you're right. It's about confidence building. And this is not the first time, and I talked to you about it, about yeah. this is not the first time I've gone through these quarterfinals. Third and, time, yeah. And the fact, though, every time these these prep weekends, it wasn't like I was looking forward to doing five workouts in three days. <laughs> yeah. But doing that challenging one on Friday mm -hmm. and then knocking out two today, you get into this rhythm, you get into this feel with it. Adrenaline, Ad yeah. Yeah, the adrenaline and you do wonder what is my strict press going to be? What will my one rep max be after doing this? And when you do it and you're, you surprise yourself mm -hmm. just because you're relying on your conditioning, the training yeah. and, and everything else that you've been doing, it is confidence building. Yeah. Yeah. If you told, and Hinshaw's right and the workout programming is right. If you, if you show someone what they can do, that's so much better than saying, hey, you're going to go into this weekend right. like and a, you're, you're going to do awesome. Imagine what if I just thought, Sam, you could do five workouts in three days. Yeah. Sam, you could PR your deadlift right. by, by yourself in a corner after a workout. Right. And right. it wasn't like I, w I told myself I was going to PR. I just said, let me see how this feels. Yeah. I did take a, big, a bigger jump on the last deadlift just mm -hmm. because it felt okay. And I said, let's take a risk and see what happens. Yeah. If I fail it, I don't have to worry because I got the quarterfinals coming up anyway. Yep. So let me take a little bit of a risk. Benefit of taking a risk. And you know what? I failed the first one, yep. the t attempt. And then you talked to me about it and the tips you said, which was basically, listen, that bar ain't going to move at first. It doesn't feel like it, but you are doing something. It's progressing. It's, yeah. You're making a progression because when I did pick it up, I felt like, I'm it's stuck. Dude, it's I'm, stuck. I can't do anything. <laughs> but have all, all been there. Right. But yeah. then when you did it, I was like, okay, let me just keep powering through for another like second or two. And then I felt the bar move and then I was able to, to get it up there. Mm. That's the kind of thing that as me as a coach, I want to help impart on others. And, and to go back to Henshaw, if you have not experienced that on your own, or if you hadn't experienced it and you're coaching me through that, mm. how are you, how are you going to relate that to me? Yep. And so all of these things uh, improve us as athletes, but they also improve us as coaches because we can take these things and then also impart them to others. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my closing thought on Hinshaw is this, I always wanted to get this and end it with this way. If you want to say a closing piece as well, he, he challenged my way of thinking and he will impact the way I coach and program for, for a long time, maybe forever. But he also reaffirmed some of the ways I've been thinking and programming and coaching for the past seven, eight years. It, it like, there's a lot of things, both psychological and the actual like programming, actual workouts for individuals, for a class fitness setting that it's really cool to see someone that you feel like you're on the same, it's like you're in the same church, but he's in, he's in the front pew. I'm in one of the rear pews, but like we're in the same room, you know? And, and it, but I also, because he's all the way up there in that front pew, I really want to try and get up there and progress my way, just like an athlete would progress their way up there. And I'll tell him right now, if he ever comes out with an L2, I'm signing up and hopefully I'll see him again. Yeah, he's he's a coach who's doing it the right way. I'm so looking forward to what he's doing for the next three or four years. I think he scratched the surface on some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And you're right, I, I'm definitely signing up for anything else that he has for sure. Maybe we'll get him at Bison someday. All right, thank you guys. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time out of your day to listen to the Herd Fit Podcast. Be on the lookout for next week's episode.